Okay, so we'll get started. So welcome to today's session for Disability History Month. And it's brought to you all by partners from the Integrated Care System, which is health and social care partners and wider partners, including fire, police and other colleagues like Nottingham City Homes. Um, Disability History Month, as you can see from my background, is celebrated this year between the 18th of November and the 18th of December. So as an integrated care partnership, we've got the conference, which is on Friday between 12 and 2 for Disability History Month. But we thought we'd bring an extra special intriguing one, which is on food and mood. So um, we all know the phrase, you are what you eat. So I'm really intrigued to know about how food affects my mood. Uh, really chuffed that I've just had my brown flakes this morning, so I'm feeling quite healthy already. <laughs> but without further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce you to Charlotte Rendell and Jackie Ransom, who are both community dietitians within the Department of Nutrition and Dietetics at Notts Healthcare. Now, what um, Charlotte and Jackie have asked is that quite, please do put questions in the chat, but uh, we'll answer any questions at the end if that's OK. Um, and we'll have plenty of time for questions. And between us, we'll, we'll pick them all up. So over to you, Charlotte and Jackie. Thank you. That's great, thank you. I'll just um, share the slides. Thanks, Catherine. OK. OK. So I'll I'll start off. Um, I'm Jackie, uh, and then um, Charlotte will take over for the second half of the presentation. So, as Catherine mentioned, it's um, our talks about food and mood, eating well for mind and body. So I just wanted to go through a little bit about what uh, we'll both be covering today. It's a little bit of a whistle stop tour. Um, and we will uh, start off with a, a general introduction to the food groups, uh, the different food groups. We're going to talk a bit about carbohydrates because obviously there's often a little bit of um, bad rep given to carbohydrates. So we kind of want to, to share the facts around those. Uh, a little bit about myth, myth busting. We're going to cover whether there's one diet that fits all. Um, and then Charlotte's going to talk about hydration, lunch breaks, food and mood. OK, um, so it will be general aspects of nutrition and generally about an hour, but we're hoping to finish a little bit earlier uh, if we can. OK, let's go into uh, the next slide. OK, so hope. Hopefully, um, this is uh, a lot of you will be familiar with this, the Eat Well Guide. Um, it is aimed at the general population and it's not suitable for groups such as those, for example, that may have an eating disorder or that they require a higher proportion of protein or fat, for example. We do recognise that, that the foods on the Eat Well Guide are not culturally diverse. Uh, which is an issue, but uh, thankfully we now have a South Asian Eat Well Guide too um, that, that's available. Something else that I wanted to mention as well is that um, in terms of, of uh, those households that have children in the bottom two deciles where the parents earn less than around £15,860, um, 42, so 42% of after housing disposable income would have to be spent to meet the Eat Well Guide costs. Well, of course, that's quite a lot of, of the income just to achieve this. And also, uh, in addition, more than six in 10, so 62% of working age people referred to food banks in early 2020 were disabled. And this is more than three times the rate in the general population. Okay. But despite its flaws, like it says, it's, it is a guide, so it, it can be used as a guide just to give give you an idea of, of what the different food groups are and their roles. And I am just going to go through this generally. Obviously, if there's any more uh, questions about the different food groups, then feel free, obviously, we'll, uh, to put it in the chat and we'll answer that at the end. So I'll just start with the fruit and vegetables. And this includes canned, dried, frozen, 
It's an important source of vitamins and minerals as well as fiber. And as you can tell, it forms a large part of the diet. Probably a lot of you are familiar often about the, the five fruit and vegetables a day, trying to get those in. Um, and, um, you know, like I say, we often say like a rainbow, a colorful array of, of different fruits and vegetables. So going for as many different types as possible. Next group, so I'll just briefly mention the starchy carbohydrates because I'm going to go on and talk about that in the next slide. Um, like I said, they do get a bad rep. They can be separated, sorry, they are separated into starchy carbohydrates and sugary carbohydrates. So the starchy ones can be a good source of fiber, energy and B vitamins. The other one I wanted to mention is fats. Um, so, you know, we do need fat in our diet. They do help uh, to absorb fat soluble vitamins, for example. Uh, the unsaturated fats, which are found in things like vegetable oil, nuts, plant based spreads, are better for our heart health than saturated fats, which can be in a lot of animal products, things, processed foods, those kind of um, foods. Uh, Okay, so in terms of uh, protein, so there's uh, two groups here that, that do contain protein. So we'll look at the ones that the meat, fish, eggs, beans, lentils, nuts, kidney beans, all those kind of things. Um, we usually say about a third of your diet uh, should contain these. A good source of protein, which is for growth and repair. In terms of the, the dairy section, so milk, yogurt, cheese, uh, they do contain protein as well as other uh, things like vitamin B12 uh, and uh, calcium, which of course, which is, is good for, for the bones. Again, in terms of, of um, portions of dairy, um, so generally it'd be like a half pint of milk, a matchbox size of cheese. And when I say matchbox, I don't mean the family size. I mean the small size um, just to make sure. So it's about 30 grams and then um, yogurts as well. Uh, they're all good sources. So it's really important that there's two to three servings a day. And uh, like I mentioned, you know, with with the meat and fish is, is about a third um, of, of the diet. Okay, uh, things like sweets, chocolates, they did used to be on the Eat Well Guide, um, but as you can see, obviously, they've been, they've been moved to the side so that, um, you know, the idea is obviously they're not eaten as often. But of course, they are part of a healthy, balanced diet, you know, and they do play in an important role. You know, a lot of us do enjoy to have, you know, some sweet foods um, or, or, you know, high, some high calorie foods such as crisps, those kind of things. You know, we don't just eat nutrients. Food plays an important part in terms of the social side of things. So we're not saying don't have them as part of your diet, but it's looking at the overall proportion of your diet. Uh, and, and like I said, the Eat Well Guide just, just helps with that. Okay. So carbohydrates. Okay. So like I said, you know, often get a bad rep. So what are the facts? So to give it is a biological uh, definition, it's a carbohydrate is any of the group of organic compounds consisting of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. So when we consume carbohydrate foods, they get broken down into glucose, which is used by our cells for energy. There are different types of carbohydrates. You've got your starchy carbohydrates and your sugary ones. There are natural sugars, for example, found in milk and fruit, for instance. And then um, you've got the, um, the sugary carbohydrates, what's known as free sugars that are added to products to give it its sweetness. Do you want to go to the next slide? Sorry, Jackie. Uh, no, sorry. Give me one second. I'm just scrolling Sorry. down. Uh, OK, so <clears throat> glucose is the preferred energy source uh, for the body. So if we don't consume any carbohydrates, we might feel quite groggy, lacking in energy. And they're also an important source of fiber. And, and we often find many that are following a low carbohydrate 
uh, diet may experience constipation as a result because obviously the, the, the fibre helps to provide that bulk uh, to help with opening the bowels. There are also a source of B vitamins, the starchy carbohydrates, which can help the body convert food into energy and also to maintain healthy cells and tissues. Yeah, next slide, please, Charlotte. Okay. So this uh, infographic has been produced by the dietitian called Maeve, Maeve Hannon. So she's a registered dietitian and she's got the, is it the a website, Charlotte? Yeah, it's yeah. Um, a, a blog and also on um, Instagram. Um, she's known as Dietetically Speaking. Um, yeah. She's given us permission yeah. to, to share this today. So we often hear as dietitians that bread is bad and, and, and often it is the food that's cut out. But I quite like this that she share uh, that she's allowed to share because um, it, it helps us see there are many uh, benefits to, to the humble loaf. So as you can see, you know, two slices provide six grams of protein. As we mentioned, it's good for growth and repair. They, it is tasty convenience quite easy to, to to do a sandwich and take it with you to work it is actually low in saturated fat um and it and it contains those carbohydrates which help to fuel our body you know particularly as well if if we're exercising so it two slices uh, it's about 30 grams of carbohydrate there's no added sugar if you opt for the whole grain so there's lots of different ones you've got the granary seeded bread those kind of things uh, they're a good source of fiber and uh, generally so it's about four grams for two slices it's got a variety of vitamins and minerals particularly the whole grain versions and two slices contain about one and a half grams of salt and the recommendations for adults are a maximum of six a day um just uh just let me check if I could. And just a final point on this. So on September the 20th, 2021, the UK government announced it will introduce mandatory fortification of non whole meal wheat flour with folic acid. And this is really important uh, to help reduce neural tube defects in babies. So that's really good that, that they've done that from September this year. OK, thanks. Uh, Charlotte so myth busting so we'll just go through each of these and um, so as part of our role as dietitians it, it is to inform the public about the facts and evidence base and of course there's lots of myths about there out there about diet and nutrition which aren't evidence-based and obviously the problem is um you know when a lot of people read these things therefore they, they'll often restrict things in the diet that they don't need to so let's start with can eggs increase cholesterol? So eggs uh, do contain cholesterol, but they don't increase cholesterol in the blood. Um, I think many, many years ago, I think when I started as a Bamfire dietitian about 16 years ago now, um, I think it just come in then that that because uh, before, basically, if you had a heart attack or, or problems with heart disease, they used to say oh, only so many eggs a week because they did used to think that that increased cholesterol in blood but new research came out to show that it doesn't have an effect um they're really good for your eggs they they're a good source of protein iron iodine zinc and choline as well as other nutrients as well um, and it's more the saturated fat that's um not good for for your heart than than eggs so they're perfectly fine to have so no they don't increase cholesterol levels fruit is it high in sugar so fruit contains a type of sugar called fructose but they uh, which is known as a natural sugar but they also contain fiber vitamins minerals and different fruits obviously contain different amounts of sugar but this sugar is released very slowly um, it's different to the free sugars which i mentioned earlier and these are things that are added to desserts and fizzy drinks which basically aren't nutrient dense so um, yes, it does contain um, sugar, but it's a natural sugar and it's got lots of benefits fruit. So as we mentioned on the first slide, you know, it's it's including that, um, uh, you know, as, as, as part of your diet. OK, gluten, is it the enemy? So I've, I've spoken to a lot of patients that have decided just to take gluten out of the diet for lots of reasons. 
and um, gluten is, is actually a protein that's found in wheat, barley and rye. So what's recommended is unless you have celiac disease or an intolerance, there is no benefit to excluding gluten from the diet. It doesn't make the diet healthier. It doesn't mean you're going to lose weight quicker if you take out gluten and it can often make it less balanced. Um, and also, obviously, there's you know um in terms of, of it's often it's a lot more expensive for to follow a gluten-free diet and gluten-free products so i would say unless you've got an intolerance or celiac disease i wouldn't take it out the diet okay should i be vegan very popular now um vegan veganism and vegetarian diets for various reasons no right or wrong answer to this some people do it for environmental or ethical reasons uh, nutritionally i think the key thing is if you are going to follow a vegan diet is that you plan ahead it's really important that you get in all of the key nutrients in there so that you're not ending up with deficiencies some of these in particular are things like vitamin b12 or you know that can be in things like um dairy products meat particularly red meat those kind of things as well and obviously iodine as well um which is in um, meat and fish so if you do if it's more to do with eating sustainably um you don't necessarily have to go vegan it, you could just reduce how often you have in meat uh, so what you could do is if you're doing a dish you could swap half the meat with plant-based proteins like lentils chickpeas kidney beans those guys are, um, are a good source of protein eat seasonally and try and reduce food waste as much as possible so use up your leftovers food allergy intolerance test so in the community we we see children with with food allergies um there's no scientific basis to commercially available tests so those ones that you buy privately such as testing hair uh, often these tests will say someone is intolerant to gluten or dairy and there's no evident base for this and obviously people are cutting uh, food groups out that they don't need to and it can do more harm than good next slide please okay bear with me okay so is there one diet that fits all okay this is another question um we get asked as dietitians whether there's one particular diet that is better than another and no there isn't um each one of us has individual needs so what may work for one individual is not necessarily going to work for another and as you can see there's lots of factors that that affect what what kind of diet you know we follow or um you know or or what may work well for us um and for example you know uh, you may have a friend that's lost lots of weight for example following this set diet but the thing to look about you know is it because this person is is um exercising a lot more or is it that that diet in particular it seems to fit well with their lifestyle but probably wouldn't fit well with yours you know it may be that you don't like the type of food so the key thing is it's finding what works for you one example, for example, is like nutritional supplements. So certain groups such as infants and pregnant people are advised to supplement their diet with certain micronutrients. Of course, not needed for everybody. And, and of course, obviously, it's looking at the individual and what what they need. So in terms of diets, the most important thing is that you've got balance. So you making sure you've got that wide range of nutrients that you're not cutting out a full food group when it's not necessary because otherwise this is where nutritional deficiencies start to to happen and the key thing is not to compare yourself to it we are all different we've got all different lifestyles certain people have got certain medical conditions where they do have to follow a certain diet like for example how we talked about there are people who've got genuine allergies and intolerances and they do have to avoid certain things for example we see a lot of children with milk allergy that but it's making sure obviously that that their diet's balanced so it's like I say, it's looking what works for you. Um, I'll now let pass on to Charlotte to that's, continue. That's Thanks, Jackie. Okay. Um, so now on to hydration. So aside from food, fluids are also important in order to keep us hydrated. The body is between 55 and 75 percent water and um, and when this drops by as little as five percent, we can start feeling effects like headaches. 
Dehydration can impact concentration levels and tiredness. Every fluid counts, so soup, jelly, ice cream, thinking outside the box. Around 20% of our fluid intake comes from within our food. Um, an average adult needs about 1.5 to 2 litres of fluid a day. However, this can vary, so it's important to think about individual requirements. And this can be any fluid aside from alcohol. Um, we're probably all guilty of not drinking enough, especially when we are busy. But having a water bottle at hand um, and aiming to have a drink with each meal can help. OK, so I won't um, spend too long on this slide, but this just illustrates the amount of fluid you can get from everyday foods. Um, and um, Jackie will be posting a link at the end of the presentation so you can have access to that resource. OK, so lunch breaks um, lunch breaks um, are important, obviously, in, in order to have a break and, and work um, from work and screen time. And um, when we're eating whilst working, we might not be focusing on what we are eating and might rush what we eat, opting maybe for convenience and um, due to time over enjoyment and nutritional value. When we work in busy environments, there may be internal or external pressure to rush lunch breaks um, or to work over lunch. Um, it's important to prioritise and normalise lunch breaks, setting clear boundaries and respecting those of others. Having spaces to, um, to, to eat and relax is also vital. Um, it's important to remember that we can be more productive when we do take a break. Um, and something which might seem fine to skip for some um, may be essential for individuals with disabilities, such as mental health conditions. OK, so we're purposely try, going to try to finish a little bit early um, and we would encourage you to make time for yourself to maybe have a go at mindful eating away from your desk or workspace, focusing on the smells, the tastes, the textures of the food and taking time to enjoy each mouthful. Now on to food and mood um, disability can encompass individuals with mental health condition. It's important to note food is not a cure for mental illness, um, but can be a tool to help us take care of ourselves. The research in this area is emerging uh, due to time. We won't go into all the details and we'll aim to provide more of an overview. Um, the book that I am referencing for this section is Brain Changer by Professor Felice Jacker, um, who is um, a researcher in, in this area and it collates a lot of the research um, as well. Um, I do apologise if there's any jargon. I've tried to explain words where I can, so if anything's not clear, please do just type in, in the chat. Um, we won't dwell too much on individual nutrients. Um, as, as Jackie said earlier, we, we eat food, not nutrients. However, it is known that deficiencies in vitamins and minerals such as iron and B vitamins can cause tiredness and low energy levels. Um, there is more information about key nutrients on the food and mood BDA food fact sheet, which you can access via the link at the end. OK, so it has to be said that uh, research in the area of nutrition pose, poses many challenges. We may look at observational data where correlation does not equal causation. Um, and it can also be challenging to capture data as there is room for error in measuring dietary patterns, relying on self-reported information. These studies also don't account for genetics um, and other contributing factors um, that may be missed. However, that said, in the field of nutrition and psychiatry, there have been some interesting and um, importantly consistent results. Um, in observational uh, studies, um, there is an association between those following a Mediterranean diet, high in fruits, um, vegetables, nuts, whole grains, fish, dairy and unprocessed meats, and um, having a lower risk of depression than those following a Western diet um, and isn't explained by other factors such as income. Um, to add to this, the results are consistent with studies in other countries too. In terms of the mechanisms behind this, um, there's some really interesting science um, that potentially explains these findings. Firstly, our immune function. We know that the immune function is often impaired in those experiencing stress. So cytokines, so these are small proteins involved in cell signaling, um, are higher in the blood of many people suffering from depression. In observational studies, it has been found that those following a Mediterranean diet have a lower pro-inflammatory cytokines and C-reactive protein. So that's an acute phase protein and um, it's an inflammatory marker in the blood showing inflammation. Um, and a meta-analysis has indicated that those following a diet which produces less of an inflammatory response are 30 percent less likely on average to develop depression. 
This um, could be attributed to foods such as whole grains containing phytochemicals, which protect against oxidative stress. Another potential role is that of brain plasticity. We know the hippocampus, which is in the brain um, involved in emotional regulation, can actually change size um, and is often smaller in those with depression. Diets high in typical sort of junk food um, were associated with smaller hippocampus size. Um, epigenetics, that's also um, you know, an another word um, that we might not be sure about, so that this is a study of how your behaviours and environment um, can cause changes um, that affect the way you your genes work effectively. Um, and it it's quite a fascinating area. And we know that specific nutrients are important in regulating epigenetic processes. Um, lastly, the gut microbiota. This is a really um, fascinating and emerging area with lots more research being done now. Um, and um, we know that the gut microbiota produce key neurotransmitters such as dopamine and serotonin. Um, more than 90% of our body serotonin is produced in our gut um, and it is hypothesised um, that they signal to the central nervous system through the gut brain axis. Although it's not clear as yet whether it is this mechanism and um, if so, what, what the effect is. Um, okay, okay. So there have been some interesting clinical studies, one of which was the SMILES trial in 2017 in Australia. And it was a randomised control trial which gave individuals with clinical depression an option of either social support or support from a dietitian to help them achieve a diet more aligned with that of the Mediterranean diet here. Um, this was an adjunctive therapy um, and importantly not replacing other treatment options. Although it was a small sample size, um, they did find a large effect size um, between the two groups and a third of those in the dietary group went into remission. A similar study around the same time had very similar findings. Um, a debated topic is that of the cost of such diets. Um, a cost analysis was done and they did find that the cost of the Mediterranean diet wasn't more expensive. However, I do take this with a pinch of salt um, as uh, there are many aspects to consider aside from the cost of the food in itself. Um, however, it's important to ensure that such interventions are inclusive um, and it can't be ignored. There has been a significant rise in the use of food banks in the UK. Um, access to foods and ability to cook and utilise all the foods in such interventions, in my opinion, needs to be explored if it were to be replicated in the UK. Um, another critique of this research is I wonder whether this further amplifies the incorrect dichotomy of good and bad foods, which may not be conducive to mental well-being. When someone is experiencing depression, uh, ready meals and convenience foods may be what they are limited to due to um, their the mental effort, which can um, take to, to carry out everyday tasks. Um, and taking these limitations into account, dietitians would be best placed to assess and take holistic views of individuals and tailor such interventions to their social, economic, physiological and psychological needs. Lastly, this research took place in Australia compared to the UK um, and patients in the UK we know don't necessarily have access to therapy and may um, have long waiting lists if, if they do. Um, overall, the evidence is emerging. Um, there are, of course, limitations and it certainly isn't the panacea for mental health difficulties. However, it is um, exciting as, as, an, as an area for dietitians um, to explore sort of what roles we can potentially play. Um, lastly, something aside from food itself is the social element. Um, so cooking, socialising, special occasions. Um, it can't be underestimated the impact of these elements on, on mental health too. Just to summarise, um, so eating a balanced diet uh, with all the main food groups will ensure you get all the nutrients you need for your physical and mental well-being. Uh, carbohydrates, although you get a bad rep, are good for our physical and mental well-being. Uh, we're all individuals with a different uh, backgrounds and requirements. Um, and as Jackie said earlier, it's really important not to compare ourselves with one another. Di dehydration can impact on energy levels and concentration. Lunch breaks allow us to socialise, take time to eat and relax. Um, and there is emerging and consistent um, research illustrating the potential for diet and the management of those with depression um, alongside other treatment. Um, taking a holistic and balanced view, um, there is exciting potential for dietitians to provide such a support. However, more research is, is needed in this area. 
Dokey. OK, so um, uh, Jackie is going to um, copy and paste these links into the chat for you so you can just have a look at these um, these resources in, in your own time. OK, and I'll end there and um, feel free obviously to take longer for, um, you know, take this time now and um, to, to have your lunch and maybe have a go at some mindful eating should you wish. Um, and I'm just going to stop sharing so if anyone thank you for listening and does anyone have any any questions we'll, we'll do our best best to answer anything that um obviously we're, we're not sure we can get back to you on so Thanks, there's some questions in the chat if we can go through them first yeah so margaret has asked can we get a copy of the south asian eat well guide and Giles has sent one through already in the as a link and it's the NHS Fourth Valley one. Is that probably the one that you would use as well? Let's have a look here. Let's have a look. And then the wider question that Helen has asked is that would we be able to send out the two eWell well guides, which is both the South Asian one and the one that you, you put on the, the screen? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I just have a look at this. Yeah. Oh, that that's uh, different to mm. um, the one that I've seen. However, um, that does look really useful. That South Asian eat well plate plate. Um, what I'll do is I'll find the one that um, I was referring to. Um, I'll try and find that now. Right. Just in the chat. So that's South Asian one and uh, the normal eat well well the normal the, the standard eat well guide that is used um catherine kenyon has put virginia weiss um and i guess that's in reference to one of the researchers that you talked about uh margaret's asked if we can have the reference for the book again that you talked about i think i did post that in the chat have you posted that, it? Uh, it should be there yeah brain changer yeah i put it in the chat oh, right. Sorry, it was because it was Sarah Stones who. Yeah, and some other so references are there as well. Yeah, right. So uh, that's a book that Sarah's put on, and it's Brain Changer How Diet Can Affect Your Mental Health, Cutting Edge Science from an Expert. Yeah, that's by one. Professor Felice Jaka. It's yeah. available on Amazon Books, but there obviously are other good providers who can provide yeah. the same sort of thing. <laughs> um, recommendations for links around food and mood, you've said that. Yeah, so and we'll Laura talked about the smiles trial is a good one to look up and you picked that up Charlotte when you were talking about your food and mood as well so you've put in some BDA British Dietitians Dietetics Association food fact sheets hydration boosters one blue dot BDA work ready lunch sign so the and blue dots think sustainability isn't it Charlotte on the yeah, that's a really good document about sustainability and how um, you can uh, incorporate that in um, if you were um, wanting to, um, you know, improve your diet in, in terms of sustainability. It's a really good document to look at. Um, just trying to find the South Asian one that I was referring to, but I think the trust is, is blocking the website for some reason. I'm not sure. Um, but I'll post a link and hopefully if you copy and paste that uh, link in a, a different, uh, maybe on a laptop at home or, or something, then hopefully uh, it shouldn't be an issue. So there's lots of thank yous. And then Laura said, is there any thoughts on how we can support mental health hospital inpatients to have a more balanced diet? The quality of food provided for them is less than ideal. View of patients and staff. Depends where, because I know a lot of the um, do have dietitians that do basically specialise in that area. For example, Highbury, um, there's a dietitian there, uh, Millbrook, um, Charlotte, some of the other ones as yes, well. Yes, um, but uh, yeah, well, um, Sophie, I think she, she covers those three. Millbrook, she? Millbrook, 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 Millbrook
covers um, at the moment, she does uh, Bassett Law and um, Hybrid. And there's also, they've got the Learning Disabilities Dietitians team, which is uh, Maria Morley and I think Chloe Wright, and there's another dietitian. Um, I could ask about what material the Learning Disabilities Dietitians have got. I'm happy to do that, but I know there are dietitians that cover, I'm not sure about the Wells access to a dietitian at Wells mm. Road. Do you know that? I no, I, I, um, I'm not sure myself and I know it's quite limited mm. um, in terms of um, access to a dietitian. I don't, there's, there's certainly not um, as many mental health dietitians as um, no. there are sort of physical, I suppose. Um, um, yeah, so in terms of um, scope, it's, um, yeah. It's, uh, so if you're a member of staff from Notts Healthcare and you're trying to find out if there's a dietitian, um, contact the dietetics department. Um, and obviously, if you've got a similar one within your organisations, if not, contact your clinical lead and they'll be able to advise you. So Charlotte has put a link into the Eat Well Guide, which is NHS, but you can get that just as easily by putting the NHS Eat Well Guide into Google. And Deborah's asked, have you got a link to the healthy eating activities for you, use for use with adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities? So I was going to say, I, um, I'm happy to contact the learning disabilities dietitian, see what they've got available and what I can do is, is um, whatever they've got. I'll see if I can. Can I add it later on to the um, at some point or if um, whoever that was, they can um, contact me. Um, can you guys put your yes. email address yes. in the chat, please? Yeah, I'll put That'd it on really then. Helpful. Yeah, and then if, if you contact me, like I say, I'll, I'll speak to the learning disabilities dietitian, see what they've got available, um, and then I can forward it on. <clears throat> I'm just doing okay. it now. So Charlotte, Charlotte has put in the, the web mail for South Asian Diet from my nutriweb.com so that's it, a slightly um, different one yeah the trust is blocking that website um but you can obviously contact the it department to uh, um, get that unblocked um but i have just checked on my own phone and, and that is, is the correct one and laura Hubball has said that we don't have our access to dietitian at world road so yeah. maybe that's something that should be taken up because i understand that some of the recovery college staff were doing some work and food and mood uh, Robin, for example, was doing some work around food and mood at Wells Road. He's one of the educators, so it might be worth contacting Robin there. And then we've got a question from Margaret. Uh, does hydration affect continence? In what way do you, do you mean as in? Well, I'm thinking about uh, when you become dehydrated, you need to get to the toilet quicker and more. Is that part of what? you're looking at um when mm. when you haven't got enough fluid in your diet it's harder to uh move stuff through the gut it's it's those sorts of things what what's what's your understanding of okay I mean, a lot of things with, with the hydration obviously we um as well as seeing children we see um adults obviously one of the things isn't it is the constipation but also obviously it increases confusion when you're dehydrated um uh, also increased risk, isn't it, of, of urinary tract infection, increased risk of falls. Um, some, uh, one of the key things, isn't it, particularly for the elderly who don't like to drink as much for that reason, i.e. they need to go to the toilet and therefore can't get to the toilet quick enough. Um, and it's trying to encourage them, isn't it, to, to still do that because obviously all the other risks that are associated with with being dehydrated um so in in terms of that point of view a lot a lot won't drink as much for that reason i don't know if you want to add anything charlotte no i think i think you've um, covered that quite well jackie it's, it's something that we see a lot isn't it um and trying to explain that the risks and and um of not drinking adequately and trying to kind of weigh it up the pros and cons um giving that um information to the patient to um make sure they're well informed mm. So both Jackie and Charlotte have put their email addresses in. Uh, unfortunately, Jackie's slipped a, a typo with NHS net, so I've corrected that one. She doesn't surprise it's, me. It's the fun of having so many addresses. Um, Giles has uh, did his witty repartee, which says, thank you for an excellent presentation. <laughs> I suppose the disability of Mr. Month, it's given him a lot of food for thought. <laughs> I like it. Uh, dad jokes. Um, I like it. 
And then Margaret and many others have said thank you. So that's the ones in the chat. So does anybody else want to come on camera and ask any other questions? Now's your chance. And that was just another call for another comment about thank you for a great session. So as I said, Jackie and Charlotte's email addresses are in the chat. So if you can't access, if you're, some staff will be able to access all of the links after the conversation's over, uh, some won't. So if you have any problems with some of the links, please do contact Charlotte, Jackie or myself. Yeah. Can I so, just mention something? Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Yeah, sure. Just in terms of obviously, with the dietitians within the trust, we are all separate departments, so we're not all in one department. We are all totally separate. So, for example, learning disabilities dietitians is not within the team that I work with, but obviously we do liaise, but, but we are totally separate. That's why we're not quite so sure who covers what. Thank you. Now that explains it, because everybody's got the specialist areas, so it makes sense sometimes. So is there anything, Charlotte and Jackie, you want to add? No, yeah, just thank you for everyone mm -hmm. for listening. And um, if you've got any further questions down the line, don't hesitate to, to contact us. Sure. And Enjoy your lunch. Now's the opportunity for everybody to have some mindful eating. So without yeah. further ado, I'm going to okay. say thank you to Charlotte and Jackie. Um, as people have said in the chat, it's been a really thought-provoking conversation, very informative. And you get lots of thank yous. So well done. And thank you for supporting International Day of Disabilities and Disability History Month. Thanks, thank Catherine. You. Thanks for so Take care, everybody. And thank you. And this will be available as a recording to access later. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, Catherine, uh, Kenyon, um, if you just um, 